Welcome, guys, to the MMOs.com podcast, episode 102. Uh, Alta here, joined this week by... Joined by Omer. There it is. All right. So, just the two of us again. Uh, like we said last week, we will have a guest on uh, eventually. Something we'll plan for next time, hopefully. But for now, mm -hmm. let us move on to the weekly raid. And uh, this week, I want to talk about Steam and MMORPGs. They have been, they are now the preeminent necromancer, I would say, right? Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah. So we had uh, we had some uh, niche studios like Super Games and Red Fox uh, bringing back old, uh, shall we say, retired MMORPGs in the past. But now it seems like uh, uh, Steam has taken on this role and every game is coming up on uh, Steam. And uh, this week, Metten 2, a game probably nobody played will be on Steam. <laughs> so I want, the question is basically, has the Steam relaunch of an MMORPG gotten you to go back to that game? All right. First, I want to say, you said nobody plays Metin 2, and probably nobody plays Metin 2 today, but it's worth mentioning. Metin 2 was like the preeminent action MMORPG, free-to-play action MMORPG, before Terra and before Blade and Soul, before we had like action MMORPGs, like... You know, you had you had, you had you know stuff like Vindictus and DFO as well. But Metin Two had this really weird system where like it was kind of fast paced and actiony, but not really. So like that game had something going for it. The core combat in that game was like distinctly different, and I think that helped it stand out back then. Though it's uh, I tried going back to that game. It was on Steam, right? So I'm like, you know, this is a great time to do a first look for Metin Two. So I downloaded <laughs> it. I'm playing it, and I'm like, holy shit! Like it's so hard to get into those games. Like uh, Metin Two especially. Like that game. It almost feels like it has no soul today because no that art soul. style that no soul i know it, 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 no soul like literally means anything we want it to mean in any context but the art style is kind of like grimy it's not like it's not aesthetically pleasing the combat was still like kind of decent but when you go outside town you see like a billion wolves it was just like it didn't age well mm -hmm. so i i don't think any kind of relaunch of man 2 is going to do well and in before i check right now steam charts and it's got a billion people online no way i have to find out no way um, let's find that i'm checking uh, okay, oh okay holy Guys, I stand corrected. Metin 2 has 3,500 players online right oh now. Oh my with god! With a 24-hour peak, with a 24-hour peak of 8,000. That's insane. 8,000. Okay, never mind. We don't know shit about MMOs. Holy Hang shit! Hang up the hat, boys. <laughs> MMOs.com knows nothing about MMOs. Metin 2 is a god. 8,000 concurrent numbers. Holy shit! How? It makes no. I don't know. This is this is blowing my mind right now. That's passed out. I was gonna say the reason I did this weekly raid is because. For a Grand Fest Friday last week, we did uh, Asta, right? And that's a game yeah. I would not have played if it did not uh, reappear on Steam, right? So, and I was very happy to try it. Uh, and somebody in chat just said, you know, after seeing our video, they played it for a week and quite enjoyed it. And I didn't play mm -hmm. it for a week, but I, I actually did enjoy my time playing with the game. Mm -hmm. I don't see myself playing Metin 2, but the fact that Metin 2 outperformed Asta uh, is is quite impressive. <laughs> I mean... Is it, it is it is mind blowing. Metin Two right now is the seventy second most played game on Steam. Steam, like it's insane. Oh it makes my oh my god. <laughs> There's more people online than Call of Duty Black Ops Three. All right, Metin, Metin Two guys, Metin Two. But again, that's not that, that's not the, the latest Call of Duty. Oh my god. And that, there's actually a few other MMORPGs launching on Steam too. It, it is it is pretty ridiculous how popular some of the older games are. I think for for necromancer games though, I think Steam is not going to help them. But for games already existing, I do think going on Steam can expand their audience. Like we have, I think um, DK Online launching on Steam relatively soon. They're on Greenlight right now, and I doubt anyone remembers DK Online. This was this game was literally on Area Games for three months before it shut down. Three months. Like me, like and do you remember video. DK Online? I don't remember Donkey Kong Online. I don't remember DK Online, and I and I played a lot of these games, you know, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And if I don't remember it, <laughs> that's something. We're, we're all thinking. I, I really wish it just called the game Donkey Kong Online. Like who? Like go go the Chinese approach of giving no f's about copyrights and just go with Donkey Kong Online because at least then it's more memorable. But that's what I always thought when I thought DK Online. <laughs> but apparently, I actually didn't know this game launched if I remember correctly. I think I remember seeing it coming soon on Area Games Forever. Oh, I'm looking. I'm looking. I just realized I'm looking in the wrong spot for you. All right, sorry about that. Let me link you something on this. All right, link some DK online footage over here. All right, let's see what you got me. 
But I didn't even know this game launched. I remember it being coming soon forever, and it kind of just shut down on its own. And it was only it was in service for three months before it shut down. And it was uh. I don't know. I, I don't think it's going to make it. I mean, the game literally ran for three months back in like 2013. And in three months, they decided this game is a shitter. We're closing it, right? That's and like crazy. Some, some genius had the idea. Hold on, guys. Remember that floppy disk with DKL light on it? Let's put that shit up. Put it on Steam. Bada bing, bada boom. Let's make the money. Oh, man. This really says something about Steam's, uh, shall we say, quality controls. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what do you, we got the whole uh, user process with Steam Greenlight, okay? But they are, they are revamping that. I, I, this is not a bad thing, though. Like we were talking about quality control on Steam, but who is losing out, right? Because DK Online goes on Steam. Who loses? Okay, here's the here's the answer to that. I don't know if I buy this 100, percent but this is the this is hmm. the uh, thought process they have. So with okay, so like last year they say like thousands of games came on Steam, right? Like 40 yeah. percent of the library. A good indie game uh, really needs that front page new release exposure, right? Mm-hmm. And if the new release, uh, if the daily new release page is just filled yeah. with ninety percent trash, you know it's easy for a good game to get uh that's true. to get lost in that shuffle. So that that's that's the explanation they give. But can't like uh, isn't it, doesn't Valve curate some of like the featured stuff? Like they can they can like get rid of all the old Duker relaunches and like kind of put stuff on like different sections of the site and kind of feature the games that have higher ratings. I feel like that's up to Valve to curate that a little bit better. Anytime too many games are launching, you will get lost on that section. But here's the thing: there's a there's a tab. The, the initial tab is like I think I think that I guess they can make the default tab not new releases, right? But I think mm-hmm. right now new releases uh, is is or like popular new releases or something like that is 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 default Steam like uh, you know list if you go to the homepage. Mm-hmm. And there's another game coming out too. They both are on Steam Greenlight right now. You have uh, Mixed Masters Online. This is like a more traditional, how is this game still alive kind of thing. Mixed Masters. There's another one I never I think, heard of. What is this? What is Mixed Masters? You're, uh, you're mixing drugs, dude. Mixing <laughs> mixing concoctions. And the video is from 2011. From, uh, I think they're, they're, yeah, Play Mojo. Play Mojo. What a name. What is this? I never heard of this. It's it's an oldie. It looks like, you know what it looks like? It looks like Gunzu, kind of. Doesn't it? Here, I found a I found an early screenshot for this game, a more recent screenshot. Maybe you can show this on Steam. I searched Mixmaster and this is what came up. Oh, is it Blender? Yep, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, Mixmaster Online, boys. The Sunbeam Edition, 12 speed, launching on Steam. This looks super old though. It does. And who knows? Might might get people though. I mean, yeah, and two's got three K. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna verify this. Steam charts. I'm linking, I'm linking, I'm linking, I'm linking, I'm linking. Go verify this. Look at these numbers. All right, guys. And you know, it goes up and down with the with the time of day. So it peaks at eight thousand. Eight thousand. I think it's because, because listen, hold on. This game's actually really popular in Europe because I don't think there's a. I don't remember if there's a. There was a U.S. server, but I'm pretty sure it's hosted in Europe. So for that reason, I think a lot more Europeans play it, mm-hmm. and that's why the peak is eight eight thousand and. It's not just a one-day peak either. Like, it was the first day it came out was I think May eighth, and then now ninth and tenth. So it's been out for like two, three days, and it's been having a crazy number of people. And I am mind blown at how popular Metan Two is right now. I think Me this too. goes back to a, a bigger issue with MMORPGs, and I think a lot of people always just go back to their old MMORPG, like whatever game they grew up playing. People always return to, and I see it all the time. Like anytime. Like I see if my, one of my friends like not playing a current game. Like they always jump back to RuneScape, or FF14, or like World of Warcraft. Like there's there's certain games you will always see your friends go back to, and it happens like like clockwork. Like I see people on our Discord all the time going back to RuneScape because you know they grew up playing that game, even though like they haven't played in a while. They always go back to it, and I think Madden Two kind of benefits from that as well. Man. You get your fill of the newer game and you go back to a classic, whether you know that's Ultima Online for us. Whether that's you know Star Wars Old Republic for certain people, and RuneScape, people always go back to these games, and it, it almost makes you think that the people really want newer and more PGs. They, they just want to keep playing the games they you know, they, they love playing. I think here's the problem. There's no mm. maybe I'm wrong here, but it's I think it's rare to find someone called an MMORPG gamer. What you have is a mm. WoW gamer or like an EverQuest gamer, right, or whatever, mm. or a Final Fantasy 14 gamer, and they're not looking for another MMORPG for them. That one game fills that niche, right? So it's not yeah, like a, that makes sense. Yeah, you know. 
and more RPGs especially more than any other genre, the, the enormous time commitment you need to put in a more RPG before you really like appreciate it. You're not gonna like. I, I, I hate saying this again because a lot of these games are just not fun early on, right? They they need the time investment to get fun, whereas an FPS game is fun from like the minute you turn it on. But you're not gonna have fun in FF14 in the first like five ten hours. It's just it's the way that's just the way it works. And you you sink like thousands of hours in these games. I did a slash play in FF14, and I, I started playing the game relatively recently. Yep. I'm up to like seventy days or 80, like something wow. crazy. Like. It was at like 40, 35, or 70. It was one of those. I don't know why I forgot. But like, it's still like a lot of time, considering I, I only started playing relatively recently and I've been playing the game fairly casually. But you know, it's only after you sink a lot of time these games become fun and you become so invested in them that to, to even get to that level in another MRPG is going to require like an enormous time commitment. And you might play Black Desert Online, you might play whatever game launches, but unless you put in the thousands of hours, the 500 plus hours, it's hard to, you know, really appreciate it. That's true. Also, your time investment in an MRPG kind of carries over from char character to character. Because, like, um, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, like, a, like a private server for WoW comes out, right? If you played WoW mm -hmm. Vanilla, you know, you'll get to max level and, you know, geared and everything a lot quicker than someone who has not played it yet. Uh, and this is true for EverQuest and all these games. So, um, or probably probably also true for Mitten, too. You know, if you played it in the past, you kind of know the leveling places. Uh, and you can probably get to max level or whatever it is relatively quickly so you don't want to put in the time to a new game where you're going to be the noob scrub who sucks ass mm -hmm. but, but there is a certain amount of alert to rediscovery as well you know learning how things work is still fun finding out how to be the boss can still be pretty fun so it's not always the case but the you you yeah, your benefits obviously do carry over no i mean having played ff14 I, I i've grown to love the fact that you put all that effort into one character Alt is an awful idea. Just level one character up. Put all the classes there. Fanny Star Online 2 does it as well. And a few other games do it as well. But I feel like having to make extra characters is pretty stupid. The, the FF14 system, Fanny Star Online 2 system, it just works. Let you switch it all on one character. Hmm. But yeah, that's, I'm, that's a good point. I, I wonder if more games will do that in the future. I don't know. But in the meantime, guys, perhaps, Steam. Yeah. Uh, Steam launch. Uh, Metin 2. Biggest launch of the week, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> this might be one. Of the, this is definitely one of the biggest launches of the year. Like, how many MRPs are you going to launch with like eight thousand concurrent users? Not many. That's crazy. Not many at all. More importantly, we do have uh, Black Desert Online launching on Steam as well on May twenty fourth, and uh, it, it's going to get a lot of people too. But I think we mentioned last week you don't get like if you bought uh, Black Desert Online, you don't get Steam access. Steam access is for people that buy the game on Steam. There's no carry. There's no carryover. You can't play on Steam. So basically, only people that you see playing on Steam will be people that bought the game new. So it'll give us a good idea of how popular. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, wait, wait. Hmm. Are you saying a separate server for for Steam? No, no, no. Or, I'm just saying people. Oh, the, the people oh, that. Uh, okay, the people we see on Steam charts are gonna be new. Yes, the people. Okay, okay, yes, okay, okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Everyone you see on Steam charts will be people that bought the game new, or people that bought another account to play on Steam. Because if you if you bought the game already, you can't just transfer your character over to Steam. You because. Mm -hmm. I think I think the reason behind that is money. Steam does take a cut, and there might be a you know, process where you know everyone that buys a game on Steam, Valve will get their cut, and I guess they might get a cut of recurring you know sales in game or whatever, mm -hmm. and that's why they might want to keep it separate. But I think it'll give us a cool idea of the impact of Steam, right? Because yep. Black Desert has been online online for over a year now, so it, it'll be kind of cool to see how many people are will be willing to buy it and play it just because of a Steam launch. Mm -hmm. And these are people that had literally a year or more to to buy it. Well, you know, I, I said in the weekly rate, and, I, and this is probably true, if the price is okay, like between, let's say, 5 and $15, which I, I don't know what it's going to price it's going to launch at, but mm -hmm. probably during a sale or something, it'll hit that number. Yeah. I, I actually wouldn't mind just rebuying the game just to play on Steam <laughs> for 5 to. There between. is a huge convenience factor yeah. on just being able to open Steam and download whatever you want. It really is a huge convenience factor. I mean, for, it, a minor convenience for me right now, my brother and I are overseas. If I want to download it from the official website, I got to turn my VPN on because they block, you know, there's still IP blocks for the game. On Steam, you might have to, you know, you can just download it and then maybe toggle the IP block when you launch the game. But it, it, is, it is a hassle. It's worth mentioning too, I believe the Steam version will be IP blocked as well. There was no word on whether they're going to change it. So expect the Steam version to be region locked to NA and Europe still. Somebody said they bought BDO and never played it. Nice. The game is a free trial too. And I, I know, I do think if you never bought it, it launching on Steam maybe gives you a. I think you should buy if you never played it. It's like it goes on sale for like five bucks. 
And so yeah, if you have a copy and you haven't tried it yet, it, I I would I would give it a try. It's it's different enough uh, from the MMORPG mold to really stand out. So I do I do recommend trying that one. Are you trying to say it's unique? Unlike uh, the we the the Friday Grand Fest game we played, like Asta Online. Are you trying to say Asta Online was that unique enough for you? Mm, uh, Asta was free, so there's that going for it. But besides really? that, it, it was pretty generic. Okay. Okay. Here's a. Here's a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you a quiz on Asta Line. Let's test how well you remember and retain knowledge. All right. From last week. Okay. 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 What does? What is the subtitle for Asta Online? There's like. There's a. There's, it's like Asta, and then uh, there's something else. Okay. It's like. It's like to something wind and mountain, or something. <laughs> something super Asian, like the story of yeah. the wind and mountain, or something. Something stupid like that. It's the the war of tear tears and winds. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, I give you. I give you half credit. You got half credit. You got. Right. You got. You got the wind. I think. You missed the tier, though. The tier I missed. <laughs> and a lot of people are complaining about the BDO IP blocks. I think I've said this for a long time. I I hate the fact that region locks are a thing. Have one server or, and with different channels for every region. I mean, I understand why they do it. You know, have a local publisher service the game. Maybe they have a better understanding of local markets, how to advertise it, right? But from a player base perspective, from the user perspective, just let people play on one server. With different channels it's like it would infinitely improve people's experience um also I've, i'm seeing a few comments like uh for here in turkey for example we can't play bdo unless we mm -hmm. use a uh, vpn and i think um uh it's very important guys if you live overseas outside america or even if you live in america and this is not just a personal plug but i think it's really valuable is to get a vpn okay i think it's a it's a very essential toolkit uh item in your toolkit so uh here's a i, I dropped the link there's a, there's a few free options in there too so mm -hmm. it, you really should learn if you don't know the basics if you don't have a vpn i really recommend you do figure it out and uh take take 10 minutes to learn about it because it will broaden your horizon especially if you live in uh say peripheral countries like like i am in turkey right now and a vpn mm -hmm. is essential even to use something like wikipedia i gotta use a vpn <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you know, you wanna you wanna watch that interesting porn, the kind that the FBI may not allow. You know, turn the VPN, VPN on, all right? It's just to cover your ass, just in case. You never know. Uh, Monty Blog, is anyone use browser VPNs for a game? I, I never use a browser VPN. You're talking about those? Those are called proxies. They're not the same thing. You can use those to get around like, uh, I like work filters and stuff. But VPN is the better solution for almost all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's, yeah, VPN there's, there's free options, there's paid out. Personally, I use um, two different paid options. I'm actually paying for two VPNs. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> for me, they serve different purposes. But you know, read about it, learn about it, and then and then you know, do what you got to do you know for your own uh, needs. But uh, you should learn about it. All right, we should take this conversation to uh, my favorite game, guys. My favorite MMORPG, Ash of Creation. You guys know how much of a fanboy I am for Ash of Creation. Oh yeah, you love it. And and how much I shill this game, all right? Because there's so much, you know, it's such a great game, guys. Everybody go pledge for it. Make sure you use my affiliate link when you pledge for it. And, and buy the $5,000 bundle. Buy two $5,000 bundles, all right? But make <laughs> sure you click my referral link so I get that sweet, sweet 15%. But no, in, in, in actuality, uh, they raised $1.5 million of funding so far, and they added some more stretch goals. And what what's almost mind-boggling, uh, Matt wrote this article on Immos.com, is it's pretty crazy. When they unveiled the stretch goals, they're basically new features in the game, right? That's the way stretch goals work on Kickstarter for the most part. If you followed uh, Chronicles of Lyria, Asher Creation, Star Citizen, they always add these stretch goals that they raise more money, they'll add more features to the game. And they put they said a statement that said, all backer goals that get unlocked are given to all backers of the project, and we want to make sure you guys are aware that none of the goals on our stretch goals will result in scope creep. We have carefully planned out all the work necessary to achieve these goals, which is why they are the values they're at. We will not delay the release of the game in any way because of these goals. That is completely counterintuitive. By the essence of introducing new features and new elements, whether you know some of them are called the, an expansive new underground areas, called the Underrealm, uh, a social progression path, a thieves guild, and a new beast-like player race from the Underrealm. So adding a new race, entirely new areas, and they have the audacity to tell you that it's not going to be counted as feature creep or extend the development cycle of the game. How is that possible? You add new stuff to the game, it's going to make the game take longer to develop. This is like math one. This is just basic understanding of logic. It's definitely going to take longer to make. Um, 
But maybe they. But here's the thing. Best best case scenario, they wanted to make it from the beginning, and and they just kind of use the drip feed uh, unlock of, you know, stretch goals as kind of like a, a gimmick, right? That that's the best case scenario. What about the reverse of that though? Because they still have a, a I guess they're aiming for a 2019 or 20. I forgot the release date is what they're aiming for, but they have a, a date that they're aiming for anyway. So you think they overshot the estimate intentionally just so they could put these in there? Yes, they intentionally put these in there uh, to, you know. Maybe, that's yeah. fair. It's just the thing. There's something called, um, the, the, the way Kickstarters work is it's, they're front loaded, okay? Like the first day it comes out, you get a lot of money, right? The first few days, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest. All the, all the big news com news sites cover your Kickstarter when it launches, right? But nobody covers mm -hmm. a Kickstarter 15 days in, right? It's not like, you know, uh, I don't know IGN or whatever is going to put an article saying, well, you know, this game is 15 days into its you know Kickstarter. Yeah. They're going to they're going to talk about it the day it comes out and then the day it ends if they if they made their goal or not. So, yeah. The, the, the whole reason for these stretch goals is to kind of keep the interest going. Yeah, it makes sense. Still pretty again. silly from the say. It's not going to add any kind of creep. So, they so are, how, how much do you think this game is going to raise anyway? What's your estimate? So the, right now they're at one point five seven five. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see how far their stretch goals go down. Oof. So yeah, they did add a whole bunch of new ones here. I don't know. Two point. Okay. Okay. All right. So how many days left? Twenty. I'm going to say they're going to pass three million. I think you're optimistic. Really? I'm at two point three five million. We're going to we're going to check at the end of the campaign who is closer. I'm going to sit at two point three five. That's my precise number they're gonna be there in three days what are you talking about no no it slows them a lot they raised like a million the first day anyway and then like the next six days they only raised like 500k it's only gonna slow down from there okay so let's write this down guys let's write this down okay everyone keep track of this so omar says I'm writing it down right now. omar says what 2.3 yes i'm putting it in our in our, our notepad over here okay, i say over, over three five i say over three uh -huh. over three all right we'll see we'll see who comes closer But I mean, uh, you know, Crackles of Illyria only raised like one point something. So this game raised quite a bit more. Oh, here's the thing, Omar. I think you're forgetting. As we talked about last podcast, I don't want to rehash it, but the the guy behind Ashley Creation, he is he is a grade A expert, grandmaster marketer. Okay, whatever else he might be, he is a good marketer, right? He knows his, mm -hmm. he knows you know psychology and he knows how to hype people up, and he's gonna you know there's no way this is gonna make less than three. We'll see. I'm mean, typically my 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 two point two was based on just the the, the traditional roll off of uh mm -hmm. of lower, you know the the progressively less and less people followed on Kickstarter. But yeah, this is the only MRPG I've seen. Only only thing I've seen on Kickstarter that has a referral program where you get fifteen percent of pledges. So that alone might incentivize more content creators, whether it's you know the big YouTube gamers to make content surrounding uh you know Astro Creation. That was genius, though. I think. I think that is actually one of the main reasons for their success. Paying YouTubers that 15% kickback and content creators and websites that 15% coverage for basically hyping the game. That is pretty genius. I still think it's kind of scummy. And I think a lot of people also think that. But ultimately, I mean, I, I don't really care if it's scummy if the game comes out, right? Because then who cares, right? Nothing. Nobody was hurt if the game comes out. But if it doesn't come out, that's, that's when it's going to be a disaster, a nightmare. <clears throat> Um, and you know, people, a few guys said in chat that we're one of the few people talking out against, I guess, oh, not against, but you know, being wary, wary or cautious about the statue creation. There are a few other people out there doing it. Uh, hopefully we'll have some of them on the podcast eventually. Um, mm -hmm. like Omar said, this game is unique in giving players a kickback for getting people to give money to them during their Kickstarter. That's a key. Yeah. I don't, I, referrals work fine, right? In general. Amazon.com <clears throat> has a big referral program. You buy something, you get you get a percentage, right? Uh, if someone re mm -hmm. if someone referred you, they get a percentage. But getting a referral on a Kickstarter, like on a on a pre product, you know, thing, I don't know. It's it's crazy. And also, uh, speaking of Amazon uh, referrals, kickbacks, we did put our Amazon uh, affiliate link in the Twitch stream, and it'll be on YouTube as well. If you want to support Amazon.com podcast or just the channel in general, do click on that sweet, sweet Amazon.com uh, banner below the stream, and then buy whatever you would buy you, no you know that you would normally buy. Nothing costs extra for you. It's all the exact same thing. We get like a 2 3% uh, kickback on whatever you spend on Amazon. We all shop on Amazon.com anyway, so might as well use our link and give us that awesome support. 
Yeah, don't make us don't make us turn to Kickstarter, okay, guys. So just <laughs> just use our link when you buy on Amazon. That's all. <laughs> Somebody asked, "What do you think will come out first, Ashes of Creation or Chronicles of Lyria?" Honestly, like I, the, some of these Kickstarter and RPGs you get, they get progressively more and more sketchy. I think actually, um, I believe in Chronicles of Lyria more, though I think their release schedule doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, I, I looked at it again recently. Chronicles of Lyria expects to be in um, expects to be released by the end of this year. Release, not beta. Release. What are the odds that's going to happen? What are the odds that's going to happen? They were supposed to have an alpha in Q1 of this year as well. Then in January, February, January to March, there was supposed to be kind of some kind of alpha, which I'm not sure if it was open to the public or not, but I, I haven't seen anything about it. So I, I don't think Chronicles of Lyria can hit their schedule, but having followed that development cycle and comparing it to Ashes of Creation, I think Chronicles of Lyria is like infinitely more legit in terms of like, what's happening right the guy was more open and honest about it and that has more potential i think of actually launching but of the kickstarter mrpgs there is one kickstarter mrpg uh crowd crowdfunded mrpg rather that i am optimistic about and that's albion online i mean don't say we're, we're entirely negative on uh crowdfunded games here at the ones that do come out uh you will obviously you know um, we'll mention that obviously and albion online is different say what you what, say what you will about the game it's one of the few Western MMORPGs coming out and MMORPGs in general that's actually trying to, I guess, shake up the formula a bit. It feels like so many MMORPGs have fallen into that formula. Like so many East Asian MMORPGs, I feel like once you've played like five, ten of them, you've really played them all. It's so hard to see a game that feels and looks different. And at least with Albion Online, it's truly a different experience. It's still fundamentally an MMORPG. If you played it back, you know, in the first round of Alpha or whatever, or you wait to play it on... Uh, when there's no more wipes starting on July 11th, you'll play. It, it's a little bit different. So that game's going to come out. There's no doubt about it. They're, they're already at the point where they've, they've had co playable content for a while. So that one, you know. I think this year, okay, 2017, is the make or break year for a lot of these uh, crowdfunded uh, games. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about Crowfall. I'm talking about Elbion. I'm talking about even Camelot Unchained. I'm talking, you know, those, those games... Uh, I'm talking about Legends of Aria, right? Shards Shard Online. These games have to come out this year. If they don't, I think it's if 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 these guys can't release, there's no chance of like uh, you know Star Citizen, uh, Chronicles of Illyria, mm -hmm. or Ash of Creation ever coming out. Because the 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 ambition of these games, the ambition of games like Shards Online, I'm still gonna call it Shards Online. I don't care what they say. Yeah. Um, of, that was gonna come out too. I think of Albion, right? These these are very yeah doable games like if you play these games in the, in the in the betas or alphas you know they're good they're decent games they work they function but they're kind mm -hmm. of slow they're lower in ambition than games like chronicles of valeria Astro creation star system and if these games take five six years to come out and they still and they still can't come out these bigger games have no chance mm -hmm. and actually uh i think grizz linked a pretty hilarious uh picture i want you to share on podcast for a moment here it shows the mmogames.com Chronicles of Lyria Best in the MO Award. How do you give this game best in the MO when it's in 20? First of all, this is 2016, right? This is when they did like before they unveiled it, maybe before they unveiled the Kickstarter. Nobody's played the game. How do you give it an award for being the best in the MMO? There are actually in the MOs that came out that would <clears throat> that, that that should get this award. Not Chronicles of Lyria. And they actually hired programmers to make the game after they raised money for Kickstarter. They started hiring actual programmers once they got the Kickstarter money. It was literally unplayable in 2016, and it's literally, literally unplayable now. It's a joke that they give out these awards for games that just aren't even out yet or playable. Maybe put, like, best Kickstarter never coming out MMO. You know, that's fine. You put that award there, they can get that award. You know, the best never coming out Kickstarter MMO. But how do you put this nonsense? <laughs> at least at least, it's, it's, at least, least MORPG.com <laughs> has a good sense of a category for mo most anticipated, right? Yes. Because that's open-ended. <clears throat> but you can't say it's the best, you know, whatever, indie... MMO. Yeah, I'm, I'm minorly triggered by this, all right? People, <clears throat> we've talked about the hype machine before and the danger of hyping games up too much. And it's not good for anyone to get this kind of, this hyped over anything. <laughs> Overwatch level gold. I don't think I can, I can ever be triggered as much as my uh, stance on Overwatch's ranking system, but everyone getting gold medals. But uh, this this did, you know, tr trigger me a little bit. Um, while we're on <laughs> um, Kickstarter stuff, <clears throat> uh, I actually, Omar linked me a video on uh, some of the latest, I guess, in-game or in-engine in uh, shots yeah. of, uh, what's it called? Uh, Camelot, Camelot Unchained. Camelot Unchained. Yeah, so this is a game <coughs> by the guys who made the original Dark Age of Camelot, a game I still love, a game mm -hmm. I would 
wouldn't mind playing on Uthgard, the private server Dark Age of Camelot. But anyway, this is our latest project. It's it was it's been in the works for God knows like what four years now at least. Yeah, four years. The kick the, I think the Kickstarter was in 2013, and I'm sure they worked on it for a while <clears throat> before it got the Kickstarter as well. Not sure my voice is dying. Yep, this was this was announced in 2012, Kickstarter 2013, and it's been in the works ever since. Uh, and this is what they have. I'm showing you, you guys are seeing a video. Uh, all I got to say is I, I don't know. I don't know. These these graphics aren't aren't, aren't that great, you know? And uh, in terms of what's actually being shown in the video, they're trying to show off the animations for running. And they're, they're talking about making some minute improvements on like uh, walk animations, like side-to-side -side strafing animations. But what's crazy is uh, if you look at all the gameplay videos there are for Camelot Unchained, and even from the get-go, there's really not too much like combat being shown too much you know they're still they put they're still working on the game from a high level right they're still designing some elements of the game but <clears throat> it's been the game's been developed for a long time now and it is definitely saddening to see that there's still so much work to do and i think one of the big challenges for camel unchained is they are doing it within their own engine and that, that shows you like getting to a point where you can run around and show stuff is a lot harder when you're building an engine from scratch whereas somebody like Chron like uh, chronicles Illyria and Astro creation can show you like some really basic walking around stuff using Unreal Engine a lot easier. I mean, these guys clearly put a lot of you know time and effort into this game already, and there's still a ton of work to do. I mean, these guys clearly passionate, but I feel like they could have shown their passion a lot more if they just took Dark Age of Camelot and made their own private server for it with their own rule set and custom content. Like clearly they're you know they're inspired by Dark Age of Camelot. Just make a private server, make it tons of custom content, make the make the day out dream that you want, literally using Dark Age of Camelot. And I think Probably a lot of the fans appreciate that as well. You know, I've, thought, something more I've thought about, um, uh, you know, for now, Electronic Arts owns the license or IP for both Dark Age of Camelot mm -hmm. and Ultima Online. And <clears throat> I've, I've, I follow Lord British on Twitter, right? He's the guy who made Ultima. Mm -hmm. And everyone, every once in a while, people ask him, why don't you just buy the IP back from EA, right, for Ultima? Because, yeah. you know, the guy's rich. And apparently EA just won't sell to him. He's tried, apparently. So I think the chance of... Um, of uh, Dark Age of Camelot, you know, at least officially being sold back to, mm -hmm. you know, these guys is, is pretty low, like zero, right? Yeah. So sadly... That's yeah. unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Even with uh, with the people that love City of Heroes, I guess maybe it's very difficult for them to even buy back the license they wanted to. Or, you know, with any of these old games that shut down, people do want it back. But anytime a big company owns a license or owns the game... They, they, they'd rather sooner shut it down than, I guess, sell it to somebody else. And you just see it with a lot of big websites, too. They'll just shut something down before they sell it to somebody else. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a there's a tax reason for it, too. They don't just do it out of spite or anything. Maybe there's a you know, corporate tax benefit for doing so. Have you, and have you, played, have you played any of this new game, Shroud of the Avatar? I have not played Shroud of the Avatar, but luckily for <clears throat> uh, us and everyone else out there, uh, Shroud of the Avatar mm -hmm. is actually free to play. It's free to try, I should say. Uh, from now until uh, at least like a week or so, or like a week or two, Shroud of the Avatar is free. So we will be doing a stream for it eventually, uh, you know, hopefully by next week. So we'll announce it on Twitter and on the site and all that beforehand. But uh, yeah, do do stick around for that when we do that. And speaking of uh, you know <clears throat> some of these upcoming games too, <clears throat> I think one of the most important things these games have to keep in mind, and not just Kickstarter MMORPG, literally every MMORPG, there are two things your game needs to have before you can begin to have a chance of success. And we've seen a lot of failed games not have these two things. Uh, namely, number one, low system requirements. Your game has to be playable on your average gamer's toaster, okay? Your average college kid's toaster. It has to be. Look at the games that are most successful. Look at the games, uh, look at the MMOs that are you know, making the most money. We keep a list of them on uh, MMOs.com. They all run pretty well on low-end machines. And it's super important. And two, it's got to be well optimized. Your game has to work, whereas a game like Bless is literally unplayable on my GTX 1080 top end i7. I, after 30 minutes of playing, memory leaking, my FPS drops below 20, and I just get frustrated and quit the game. So if your game literally, those two things are a must. That's like the stepping stone, like the beginning of your game. Before your game even goes to pre-alpha, okay? Make sure it's, it just works and it's got fairly low system requirements. And I think most people don't care about graphics that much, especially in MMORPGs more so than other games. You know, you want to play the latest and best shooter? Yeah, I get it. Like, too many shooters, the core mechanics in FPS games are very similar. Whether you're playing Call of Duty, whether you're playing Overwatch, 
CS scope. Yes, there's different how much each hit does different damage. Hit registration is a little bit different as well. But the core mechanics are all the same. And you do use graphics to, dis- to differentiate yourself. But in MMORPGs, you don't play for the graphics at all. I mean, if you play for the graphics, Metin 2 would not have 8,000 players on Steam. No, and RuneScape would not be as ginormous as it is today. People don't, MMORPG players especially, don't care too much about graphics. Optimization is way more important, and being able to play the game is more important. Uh, about this, um, before we go too far, so this is the in game yeah. for uh, Camel Unchained on their own <clears> engine, right? <throat> And the reason it doesn't look great, guys, is because they want to optimize it for big PvP scale combat, okay? So one of their goals is 1,000 versus 1,000 PvP. And for that to happen, they could not use an off-the-shelf engine, okay? Because I don't know if you guys know this. I don't know if you guys realize this, but if you've played any MMORPGs made on, like, Unreal Engine or, or whatever, it, it they, they don't they don't handle lots of players on the same map that well. And that is what worries me about Ashes of Creation. They actually showed gameplay. What they say is in-game gameplay uh, on Mm -hmm. one of their streams. You know, they're actually streaming pretty often. And when they show in-game graphics in... uh, This is an old one, but... The the graphics look beautiful in Ashley Creation. And I don't see how they can have even, like, let's say, 100 people on this map while it looks like this. It it feels like it's going to lag, you know, to the wazoo. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if these guys... Do they have the magic talent uh, to write the netcode better for uh unreal engine i don't know you know i but i doubt it let's i'll just say that hold on hold on hold on you tell me remember quinn and exiles they can't get 50 they can't get more than 25 people on the server without it being un, 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 unplayably laggy you, which you know funcom is like a 30 plus million dollar company maybe more probably way more than that actually mm-hmm. they couldn't figure it out you're gonna tell me these in the kickstarter funded mrpgs are gonna make uh, unreal engine work with a massive scale not impossible it's not gonna happen yeah, I, literally the guy who worked at MMORP just couldn't get Code Exile to work on launch day, and launch month with more than 30 players on a server. Never going to happen. Yeah, I, I don't think anything they showed so <clears throat> far had multiple clients running. Um, it's just one guy running an Unreal Engine, you know, build. So it's it's very <clears throat> different when you have, you know, 100 guys interacting. I think it's going to, I think it's, it's just like, with, this, with the current fidelity of graphics they have, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Actually, somebody mentioned Guild Wars 2 as well. Uh, I saw a pretty interesting poll, actually, on um, our MRPG. Maybe worth sharing. People are saying if there's only four, only these four MMOs available, which one would you play? And first, before you click on the link, there's four games that they're asking people, like, what is the, of these four games, which ones would you play? So click on that link, actually, and before you see the results, take a look. And which one do you think is going to win out? Okay, if there you were have, only four MMOs yeah. available, which would you mean? World of Warcraft, Guild Wars 2... Hmm. I, I do want to say these are like some of the most popular MMORPGs, these four. And honestly, having played so many, like, uh, like we played, we played so many other Duker MMORPGs, not so big MMORPGs. Of MMORPGs, of what a traditional MMORPG is supposed to be, I think these four are really amongst the best. All right, these are four solid MMORPGs that have a lot going for them. They've they've been around for a while. They're pretty player bases. And yeah, these are okay, these are your traditional MRPG experience. I'll I'll answer honestly for me, okay, guys. So don't 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 kill mm-hmm. me here. Wow, I'm going with wow. Eric, no, you already voted the, in this poll. I didn't vote in this poll. Have your results? I voted already. That's why. Okay. Wow, I'm surprised. Final Fantasy beat out wow. Again, only 249 votes, so it's not like this is not science over here either. But I mean, I was pleasantly surprised to see FF14 uh, representing it, on that list. I'll link it here too. Let these guys jump mm-hmm. in on it. Look, perhaps it's because I played WoW already, and I, 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 WoW is one of those games I really didn't enjoy returning to. I, I loved WoW, right? I played the vanilla experience, and I absolutely loved it, right? It was my, one of my favorite MMORPGs, and still is one of my favorite MMORPGs, and I came back to it, right? It's not that I didn't see the new content. I came back during Mr. Pandaria, and I regrinded from one to max level, right? I didn't do any of the buying, skipping that content. I, I played through the experience leveling everything, right? And I played up to Warlords of Draenor. I bought Warlords of Draenor, and I played it for t- like 20 minutes, and I, and I uninstalled it, and I was done, right? I, I tried all the new dungeons and everything. It wasn't bad, but, like, it didn't do it for me. It was it was a similar experience that just felt uh, they made it a lot easier. But with I voted FF14 because probably because I haven't experienced everything in FF14 just yet either. Mm-hmm. I'm still kind of just scratching the surface because there's, there's so much content in FF14. There's so much crap to collect. There's so much glamour. There's so much. There's so much to do in FF14 that even with like, I, I have people, I have friends on the game that played for 450 plus days, and they're still logging in every day to keep getting more stuff. 
So I, I feel like for me, it would be FF14 only because I haven't experienced everything yet. And for some reason, I didn't enjoy my return to WoW that much. Wow. But still, WoW is still captured a lot of cachet. I think WoW is just <clears throat> like the vanilla MRPG, MRPG, the easiest MRPG you get into. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're a friend, you want to introduce, introduce them to MRPGs. WoW might be literally the easiest game to get them into, only because it, it is very casual friendly. It, it is very well optimized. That game will run on any toaster PC and it'll run really well. You know, and from there, that can be your stepping stone if you want to go anywhere else. True, true. And FF14 is the Weeaboo Warcraft. Uh, Zenmax, I'm not going to deny that. The game is very, you know, I guess, weeb friendly. Weeb but uh, friendly. It, it's a really fun game. I, I, I started playing more FF14 again recently only because Stormblood is actually coming out. And finally, I, I can look forward to doing some new content as it comes out rather than being perpetually behind. So I have an incentive now to catch up fully. So I've been playing a bit more FF14 lately myself. Perhaps that's why I'm gushing with some FF14 love. My, my issue with... Uh... FF14 has always been like just a little slow paced because of the console element. Mm -hmm. right, we, they got rid of the PS3 players, all right? They're, they're discontinuing PS3 support. All right. We only have to deal with PS4 oh, that's console better. players that's now. Better. But it still blows my mind that so many people play FF14 on console. One of my free company, my guild members, is like, yo, I play on console. I'm like, and I instantly judged him, all right? I instantly judged this guy, like, oh my God, how do you do this on a console? And like, when they trade with you, when they talk to you, when they. Like when they fight, it just it's so noticeable that it's just slower. Wow. I judge them. And I do I do think sock uh, sock, I do think the game stands on its own merits as well. It just it does attract a lot of uh, anime fans as well because of the aesthetic, because of the emotion game. And it's, it's a solid game though. And, it, and the game has literally the cutest uh, emotes and outfits in MMORP. They got the glamour thing down. It shows that so many people play these games for the social element because uh, it, it's weird. You know, I, I was doing my questing and then, you know, my friend logs in and two of my friends bump into me in town and we just start like sitting down in our house talking for like an hour and a half, like literally using the game as a chat room. I was doing my questing and they interrupted me and then we just started talking for like an hour and a half. And I think being able to do random modes and it, the social element is so strong. And then more RPGs where I do, I cannot emphasize this enough. Developers need to work, you know, have good gameplay, right? But gameplay isn't everything. Combat is not everything. I think what makes FF14 great is not the combat. I think anyone that plays FF14 will agree that everything else surrounding the game is what makes it fun. And I don't think you can have the game without combat either, but it's literally everything else around the game that makes it a fun experience. That's true. And here's the thing. So many people today, um, mm -hmm. when MRPG is announced or talked about, they say stuff like, well, if it's tab targeting, I'm not interested, right? I only want to play yeah. action combat. But here's the thing. An MRPG can never compete on combat, right? With, a, with, a, with other genres, right? You can't because it's, it's made with a different style, you know, with, with a different time mm -hmm. frame. You know, an action game, like, you know, comes out every year or every other year, right? A series? Yeah. An MRPG has to last for, you know, they got to plan it for 10 years. So they can't mm -hmm. compete with, with combat with these other genres. So pe when people say stuff like, I'm not going to play if it doesn't have, you know, this amazing you know, real-time combat, I think they're writing, they're kind of dooming the genre because that, that can't be I the agree. draw, you know? It, it, it's it's impossible. Even WoW. I don't think you even WoW, like, the core gameplay is not why you play. It's the progression of your character. It's everything else in the game. The the combat is never the, the main pull. In Blade of Soul, I think it was, and that was a unique experience. But I it, it really... It can never be the main pull, really. But here's the thing: even you, even Blade mm -hmm. Soul, the guys who are playing yeah. it since launch till now, right? Or, or yeah. in, it's in, not the combat for in that, Korea, yeah. right? Or whatever, five years or whatever. Or, or the guys yeah. playing it here in five years from now, they're not gonna be playing for combat. They gotta be playing yeah. for the you know, there's the, the friends they made, you know, the experiences, they, you know, the shared experiences. It's not gonna be the combat, even if it's the combat that draw 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 drew them in. Draws initially. them initially, yeah. yeah. And it just games need to have more stuff to do besides kill enemies. All right. Add some fun stuff. Add some silly stuff like chocobo racing, the the housing elements, and make it detailed. And add tons of content that way. It'll keep players hooked. You need to have all that good stuff in it too. Yeah, people say you know if combat is going to be the main pull, you make the whole damn game about it. And that's why there's so many other games you can play besides MMORPGs if you want combat to be your main thing. Mm -hmm. MMORPGs have to do all this other stuff. So either you know if you focus everything on combat, everything else will suck and it won't keep you there. Well, here's the thing. Let's say you spend, you know, first of all, to make a big MMORPG, you got to spend a lot of money, right? So let's say you spend yeah. all this money, you make a game with great combat, right? 
Every, mm-hmm. What everyone wants. Everyone's gonna play for one year, and then the next year or two years, when the next big action you know game comes out, they're all gonna go action to that. Game, yeah. If all they're after is they think more RPG, yeah. No, no, yeah, not even more RPG, just whatever. You know, like the next Dark Souls comes out, they're all gonna go to that because or Monster Hunter or whatever, whatever it is that they like combat. Because because you know the guys chasing the action combat or whatever or the fluid combat or like the combat experience, they're always gonna have new games to play. So you can't, you cannot <laughs> cater to those people. And speaking of uh, of that action combat, there's another action combat in RPG launching in the West soon. And look, it's not, it's Critica Online, and I think the game's pretty fun. But it just it's so weird having played Critica, having played Soul Worker, having Soul, Soul Worker Online, having played uh, Arpeel, there are Vindictus, Dragon Nest, right? All these games feel <laughs> like the exact same formula, like the first game I played, like Critica, with action combat where it's a persistent uh, towns, persistent dungeons rather, and uh, instance instance dungeons, persistent towns, right? Has been Lunia, like literally back in EG or even before EG days, and that was like such a cool experience. I'm like, whoa, the combat in this game is really cool, right? This is when free to play games were just starting. There weren't that many action and more RPGs out there, right? I thought the combat was amazing, but then we see Dragon's Nest, Vindictus, and DFO. There's, there's so many games like this, and I hope Critica can kind of survive, but that. It feels so formulaic at this point. That, that that system of these instance dungeons, persistent towns. It's the most cookie cutter game design ever. And I, I mean, I haven't played Critical that much because of this higher ping on the, the Southeast Asian version. I'm going to try the NA one again, but I've never been able to play these action games for too long. It's just, I've never been able to do it, personally. I mean, I haven't tried I feel this like, one yet. Yeah. And uh, we're going to play this one for Friday, right? Yes, we're hoping to. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you guys will see us play Critica online this Friday. Kizia says, fly away. That was the intro song to uh, Lunia back in the day on EG. When you, I think when you launched the game, the game was, it was a pretty good intro song. And it's it just, there are so many games like this. It just, I, I, I hope there's room in the market for it. And I feel like every, well, the problem too with, with action and RPGs, you had Hero Wars as well, right? People that want that combat, it, it, it's, it's leading the game developers making more games like Critica and Hero Wars. And those games never get too big. Outside of DFO, I don't think any of these games are too successful. I, mean, I think my favorite one in this genre, I would have to say, is Vindictus. I think Vindictus mm-hmm. did really well. Uh, it looked great. And I think Vindictus was one, the, was one of the few games, not by Steam, not by Valve, that ran on the Source engine. So that's another fun fact. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. Maybe an more pitch in the Source engine. Are there any other and more pitches besides that on Source? I don't know if there's any other, but uh, it is a little fun fact there, tidbit. And, and the, you know the graphics kind of hold out. You know, I'd say I just yeah. saw the trailer here for Critica, and I know it's an old game just being published here now, new, but the graphics mm-hmm. don't look great. You know, I gotta say. Mm-hmm. So uh, Vindictus has held out, has held out pretty well in comparison. It's. And the thing is with uh, Critica as well, I, I don't know if they're going to get the hype going, right? I think some people are excited for the game, but the thing about Critica is you can literally play the game right now. You can play it yesterday. You can play it months ago on the Southeast Asian version. It's literally free to play, I think, on Play Park, and it's in English as well on South, in Southeast Asia. Back when I played it, I don't remember there be, if there was an IP blocker or not, but even if there is, you can get around it with the VPNs, the free VPNs out there. So you don't have to buy a Founders Pack to play the beta that's coming out on uh, North America and on uh, May 24th. That's a closed beta anyway, so it's going to wipe after that. But if you want to play Critica and see what the game is about, maybe before you buy the, the Founders Pack, this is one of the few, few chances you can actually play a game before Founders Packs. Like, you can play the Southeast Asian version and see if it's up your alley. Or right just away. watch us on Friday, and then you can see if yeah, it's up your alley. Yeah, that too. There are so many. Like, there are, there are way too many games that fit this mold, though. It just, it's, it's insane. The only, like, when you say action and more RPG, there really aren't that many actual action and more RPGs outside of, with, with persistent worlds, I'm saying. You have, like, Blade and Soul, you have Terra. And those are the two, only two that come to my mind right now. Because they're the only two really, oh, ESO as well, right? These are, like, the only memorable ones out there. So I think when people say, oh, you can have great action, BDO as well, I'm sorry, Black Desert Online. Like, Black Desert does it, yeah, but there are literally only, like, four games that pull this off, like, four well-known games that pull this off. So, and it, you really can't, Use Critica, Vindictus as good examples because those are whole different styles of games. And a lot of people that play MMORPGs don't want that experience where you're always in the persistent towns or instance dungeons. It's still an MMORPG, but it's not the same kind. 
I gotta say this crit this Critica Online website by NMAS is really well done. Yeah, it's almost like a comic book. I, I, I'm really loving the design for this website. I don't know. I, I'm not gonna buy a founders pack or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> I do like the I do like the website. So, Blue Hole is the one that made Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, right? And they own doesn't Blue Hole own in mass? Is that in mass their publishing arm? I no, I think I think it's their publishing arm, but I don't think I don't I don't think it's owned by Blue Hole. I think it's just a bunch of okay. Americans, like those ex Blizzard guys, you know. Oh, maybe. Don't. Yeah, I was. I was. I was maybe I was gonna say maybe they got that that public money to uh, to pay for that quality quality website. And Critica does look a bit like DFO, but it's, DFO's got that two D retro look to it. Yeah. Right, Critica I... May twenty fourth. Check it out. I got. I got. I got a little potential controversy. I'm afraid we might right. agree on this, right? So it won't be much of a controversy, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay, so as you guys know, G2A has been the boogeyman of the internet for a while now, right? Uh, Total mm -hmm. Biscuit made a big splash when he came out against it when uh, when I think Gearbox said they wanted to partner with T you know, G2A. So and, uh, Total Biscuit made a big stuff about that. They backtracked, yada, yada. And now we got a big change uh, from Steam. Steam is changing their gifting system. So before, if you bought a game, you could have it sent to your inventory as a gift. Like a, it was like an item like that you could like just move around mm -hmm. or whatever in your inventory. It was a copy of the game. And you could give it to people whenever you wanted, like kind of on your Steam list or whatever. And I actually used to do it all the time. I used to buy four packs uh, and just have, you know, extra copies sitting in my inventory for whenever. And then I would give them as gifts. I would I would, you know, if someone wanted to play something and I had it, I would just give it to them or sell it to them. Mm -hmm. um, but now we can no longer do that. The gifting system uh, will be drastically changed on Steam. They're going to get rid of uh, those, you know, inventory gift uh, copies, and you can only buy a gift at the checkout page. And you got to put it the guys, you know, receiving email, and you know, and, and you, so basically you got to know who you're getting the gift for beforehand. You can mm -hmm. no longer just keep them in inventory. Uh, what do you think of that? What's the purpose of this? To stop gold? To stop people from like using defrauded credit cards and getting those keys and training the them or something? The purpose of this the games? is to stop reselling. For example, a lot of people would sell their extra copies on on G two A of their extra keys. So people like me. But it seems like yeah. I got I got like a dozen gift copies in my inventory right now. Uh, but who is losing that in this situation? Like you bought multiple copies, right? So the developer made more money, right? No, but I bought a four pack for the price of like, let's say, like during a sale, I bought like a four pack for five. Yeah, four bucks. packs are a discount. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the developer still got paid for that four pack sale. At that point, like that sale was already made. I don't see how the developer loses by you reselling. It's well, almost like you bought a game and and then, yeah, the developer would like you just to buy the game again, ideally. But like you bought the game, you bought four copies of the game. Like you didn't scam it, you didn't use a yeah. stolen credit card. So I don't see how the developer has any say in that situation, right? So I. Well, here's the thing. Okay, so I bought it during a sale, let's say, right? Yeah. I bought it during like a one day sale, and I bought like mm -hmm. let's say twenty copies of the four pack. Now yeah. for the rest of the year, the developer is competing with people like me, who can offer the game at at almost that sale price, right? Let's say the sale. Let's say the sale. The the timed sale price was five dollars a copy, okay? And mm -hmm. the normal price is fifteen dollars a copy. Now okay. I'm gonna be selling my copies that I bought during the sale for the rest of the year at like eight dollars a copy, right? Sure. And I'm gonna make I'm gonna make money, and then they gotta compete with that eight dollar, you know, price. They can't charge they can't charge fifteen now. I can see why Steam is doing, it, but I feel like in that the, you know, no one's really losing in that situation. I don't think the developer is entitled to being able to control resales for their games, and I don't think that applies for console games as well as PC games in my mind. They don't have this magical right to control. If you bought if you bought a discount, it's your it's your pride. You can, you can you can you should be able to transfer. I understand why you know it's a big deal for me because if I give somebody a game, and I, I I don't think I ever bought a four pack on Steam. So really, that's never been a problem for me. Okay, you bought four packs, you give me copies, right? But I don't yeah. think I, I've ever bought a four pack. I've gifted stuff on Steam, and it's always via you know email anyway. I go to the checkout page, I put in my friend's email, or we've given away you know Steam games on MMOs.com through giveaways. And I would always just put their email on the checkout page, and that's the way I always did, uh, you know, gifts anyway on Steam. Okay, so, you're so I don't think this affects me too much. No, not really. Yeah, but I think here's the here's the funny thing. So they have like uh, they have comments actually on Steam below their posts, right? Their like update posts, and there were over a thousand mm -hmm. comments very quickly on on Steam. 
And the, what I think what people took really uh, took a notice with is the tone that Steam used. They said something like, "In order to improve your experience, we are changing the gifting oh, system." Oh, why would they say that? And then, like, that's such corporate talk. Exactly. And I, and I and I quoted somebody. One of the, uh, this was literally a random comment. Okay, it was like, "You are such hypocrites. When you make your rules a lot worse for people, at least don't pretend you are doing something good." And that and that mm -hmm. kind of captures the sentiment of most of the thousand comments when I looked. It probably it's probably more than a thousand now, but uh, you know, they really worded it like they're doing us a favor by taking away this option. You know, what a, what, what a bunch of BS. Uh, I hate when when companies use that kind of language. Like, why can't they, why can't you just ever be like straight with your user base? Your audience isn't retarded, right? You don't have to pretend they're idiots. Just tell them, look, we did this to counteract people reselling these these games on Steam. We think ultimately that if everything goes through the Steam store, it'll be you know more money for the developers, more, better games. As an overall, may create a better experience. You know, we understand that this may not be you know this this will hurt gifting. Otherwise, be straight with your audience, and you respect your audience. I feel like. They'll just have more love for your platform. Just having the audacity to say the copy paste response of we're doing this to improve the the experience is really dumb and almost insulting to your player base. It's it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, I think they kind of did the uh, chemotherapy option against G2A. You know, they kind of they kind of <laughs> reduced the functionality of Steam in order to combat uh, you know gray market selling on G2A. But here's the problem. Why was it Steam's job to go after that? Don't you think that the developers have an option, right? Can't the developers just list their games on Steam, right? Without ever selling keys. The whole transferring thing doesn't have to be a thing, you know? Like when you buy a G2A, you're not buying a... Like you, you're buying a key and then you redeem it on Steam. You the also, developers have the right to you sell can, keys. You can also buy gift copies on G2A, I'm pretty sure. I've never... I've used GTA at least like 10 times, 15 times for, for various games. And I've always ever, only ever bought keys. I've never like traded with somebody on G2A. Mm -hmm. If people were doing that, you know, that's I didn't know if that, if that's a big percent of their sales or not. Let's, let's find out. I'm going to G2A.com. And, 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 and can you solve this easier by just letting people buy a gift copy rate game? Like having like leave it to the developers. They want to be able to have this option or not. Like why does Steam have to have a blanket solution to this? Let the developer like tick a box and they list their game. Have my game transferable on Steam via gift copies. Or B, only have my game transferable via email delivery, and there's no digital copy you can trade. Done. Problem solved. I don't think I think Steam should act more like a platform and stop trying to, you know, blanket fix these things. Uh, I think they're getting a lot of pushback from developers. That's why they kind of feel they have to do it. I don't think it's a. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's them preempting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, actually, there's an interesting story I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's something I've been following for a long time. It's not really MMO related. It's more technology related, I guess. But mm -hmm. Windows 10 has been doing a big push to get people to use the Windows 10 store. And I would wager, okay, that of the 100 people watching us right now, not one has used the Windows store uh, on Windows I 10. haven't used it ever. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it right now. Let's look at it right now. Windows store. Yeah, so anyway. find it. It's it's like they're basically their app store, and they kind of want to make Windows a lot more similar to Android mm -hmm. and iOS. Uh, so basically, they want a cut of everything, every software you buy on Windows. They Windows wants a cut, uh, Microsoft wants a cut, and the reason for that is very simple. Right now, Windows is leaving a lot on the table for people like Steam. When you buy a game on Steam, guys, uh, Valve gets a thirty percent of that money in their pocket. And Steam makes you know ninety nine percent of their money, or whatever, is on on Windows. You know, not not really on Linux or whatever. So the question is, why does Microsoft leave all this money on the table for Steam and people like Steam, other you know studios, when they could be making all this money? So I don't blame them for this move. Basically, what they're doing is they're releasing a uh, uh, a version of Windows ten uh, called Windows ten S, and this mode basically only allows you to download stuff from the Windows Store. So what that means is you cannot install games or EXTs or software or, you know, discs. You, know, you can't even install something from your own disc that you own uh, if you have this version of Windows. But what you can do is you can upgrade to Windows 10 Pro for 50 bucks. But if you choose not to, you can only go through the Windows Store. So basically your computer is going to be like a phone almost, right? Like, a, like an app store on a phone. Yeah. And the, the, the sad thing is right now with the Windows version S, it's... Optional, you can always upgrade to the paid version where you can get the EXEs. Do you see uh, Microsoft pushing for a change in the future, maybe like you know, five, ten years from now, where this store will be the only option for distribution? 
I see I see them trying to trying to educate the customer or ease them into it. What you explained, I think, is still yeah, like I said, over ten years away at least, because a lot of companies and businesses rely on uh, you know, custom software. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, in Microsoft's defense, too, they want to make more money. I mean, they're seeing how much money Apple and Android are making from their app stores, where they take a thirty percent cut. And Microsoft's like, holy shit! Like, we own a pretty big platform ourselves, PC. Why don't we get this cut? Yeah. I have never used a store. Like, I'm looking at it right now. I don't know. I, I never even think about it. Like, when I want, even when I download like a new PDF reader, like when I reform it, I would just go to Google and get it from there. Yeah. But no, you can download. You, like, they have, you know, there's a Facebook app on, on Windows. Like, w- why is there an app for this on PC? It's called going to Facebook.com. You know, if you want to go on Facebook, you go to the website on PC. They have an app for it. On, like, you, you, I guess when you install it, there's an icon on your desktop. It launches like an EXE. Yeah. It's so on. Uh, and you know, a lot of guys, obviously, I kind of expected people in comments to kind of be against this. I'm going to defend it. As long as the as long as they keep the... When, right now, Windows costs money, right? Yeah. I, I mean, everyone pirates it that knows what they're doing. But the fact is, it costs money. And as long as they keep that version, you know, the paid version, uh, you know, basically the way it is now where you can just run software, whatever you want, mm-hmm. what is wrong with them offering a cheaper or even free option that goes through their store. And then that way it's free to buy or free to use. And instead they get 30% of the software sales on the store and as a way to recoup their, you know, free OS. I, why is that a lose? You know, why is, why does that like, why is everyone so against that? I don't understand. I think they're against it because they think it should be the only option eventually. I think, you know, having the two options right now, lets them save face, right? Oh, you know, you can always pay the third upgrade fee, right? But people are seeing that th- that third option will go away in the future. Mm-hmm. If that option is always there, I don't think anyone actually cares, right? But the moment they introduce this, my, when I first read this, my immediate thought, like, holy crap, they're going to ruin PC. They're going to ruin PC gaming and PC everything by making everyone use the Windows Store. That's, their eyes are lighting up with, with, dollar, with dollar signs when they, when they thought of this idea. And I think the only reason they haven't done this yet, requiring it, is because of the antitrust of a lot of issues and a lot of blowback right away. They're, they're going to ease people into it. Maybe, and then the upgrade will cost seventy dollars in the future, right, to, yeah, to get oh, the okay. unlocked version, yeah. and then maybe two hundred dollars, and then phase it out later, and then never upgrade that version again. You know, like they're going to push people towards this, and that's what people are afraid of. I don't want to have to use this goddamn app store for every little thing I download. Like, think of all the obscure programs you download sometimes, like really indie software. Like, I, I have a software that like resizes my windows at very specific resolutions. Like, I, I've used a few, a few reasons for recording various things, and like that wouldn't be on the App Store, like the Windows Store. It's such an obscure software. It can be there, but it's nice to be able to just download an EXE from anywhere and have it do what I want. All those English patches you use for, you know, Fanny Star Online 2, for Maple Story, for all these obscure games, you have English patches, and they're installed via EXE sometimes. And it's all done through like really obscure software. And I feel like Windows, the window, having to use the store would ruin a lot of that, a lot of cool indie culture on PC. <laughs> oh, thank you for the bits, Cash Shield. Nice. Oh, look at <laughs> that, that, that's what people are afraid of, though, personally. I, but here's the thing here's the thing. Does Microsoft owe us that? service that we currently enjoy for they don't owe us anything microsoft has is well within their rights to give us the middle finger and screw all of us right that's within their rights right but as as consumers as as a per i'd be pissed off they do that right like and i understand they have the right just i don't want to see that and i think a lot of pc gamers people watching this don't want to have to use the the windows store as well that's the only real like controversy or the real like blowback and there's a question for you (laughs) and people in chat i guess that are against this i always i think look there's linux right and we can always use Linux. If no we one want. uses. No one's going to use Linux. But we won't use you it. Try it. You can install your clock on Linux or something, right? You, we're not using it because <laughs> people like us and Steam, especially, are basically free riding on Microsoft's back, right? Like a, a program mm-hmm. like Steam that makes billions a year, right? From from mm-hmm. charging thirty percent on, on on Microsoft's platform. Like, how, if you're if you're Microsoft, how can you look? How can you stand around and watch this happen? That's bullshit. That's bullshit. Why? You know why? Why? You can't say you can't say they're free riding on Microsoft. They're free riding. <clears throat> hold on, hold on. It's like saying, uh, if they say a shopping center is free riding on, on on the cinder block manufacturer or the, the cement manufacturer. No, those two things are unrelated. Hold up. Yeah, you okay. use cement to build a shopping mall. Okay. Doesn't mean the shopping mall is riding on the back of the cement manufacturer. But, but here's the thing: the, the the store, they have to pay for those cinder blocks, right? Steam didn't pay jack shit for to Microsoft. Yeah, all the all the employees in the Steam office they have paid copies of Windows. Yeah, what are you talking about? Okay. But, so is it, they have paid copies of Microsoft Word and Excel too, by the way, because they're a business, all right? Okay. 
but uh, so, 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 the so, people that, that use format, them, that format that of charging one time, right? Yes. They that that doesn't that the value that they get Microsoft, from that doesn't Microsoft match that. Could, they, they could just as easily just charge ten dollars a month for their software for Windows as well. They could do that, right? Why do they charge a percentage like everyone else does? So the the problem is the problem is there are too many people pirate Windows, right? And this is their solution to the pi Windows no, piracy. No, no, no. This is none of the piracy. I think this is none of the piracy. But I, I don't understand how it's a free ride though, because they're literally paying for the software. The people that are pirating also are people that that work at Valve. The whole free riding thing is bullshit. You, you can say that they want to make more money. That, that's why they're doing it. It's nothing to do with free riding or they feel like they're no, getting cheated. Okay, if if right now uh, Google is getting away with getting thirty percent of everything on the Google Store, right? Yes. And Apple is getting away with thirty percent of everything on the Apple Store, right? iOS Store, whatever. Yeah, they want to make more money. That's it. That's okay. the reason they're doing it. So There's no free riding problem. So here's the thing. So you're telling me, Gabe, all right, Steam has hundred employees, right? Two hundred employees, whatever, yeah. right? So they paid at most uh, twenty thousand dollars for for Windows, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, twenty thousand dollars, and they're making like a billions a year, right? But this analogy makes no sense. The guy, that, I, let's say I bought a computer and I installed Linux on it, and I'm Mark Zuckerberg and I made Facebook, right? And through Linux, which I bought a computer for a thousand dollars, right, a monitor computer, and I made a three hundred billion dollar company using a hundred a thousand dollar PC. The guys that made the PC have no right to say, "Oh, we should have made thirty percent of Facebook." No, but there's that, a difference. That's the analogy you're bringing, hey, no, no, isn't not, it? No, it's not because the software is an ongoing service. They, they always update Windows. It's okay. not. It's not like they. It's not like they sold you a cinder block that just sits there. There's, there's not a there's, there's no firmware upgrades right. for the center block. So they want to make more money. It's the only reason they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, I, okay. I understand that that right. avenue, but the whole free riding thing doesn't make sense. When you're saying there's a free rider, they they got away with like murder. These guys basically, you know, they're living off of Microsoft because they they almost like cheated the system. I don't think it's a free riding issue. I think it's I a, think, I think they want to make more right. money issue. Okay. And I don't, I don't blame them for wanting to make more money, right? Like they see Google and you know Apple getting away with this model. Of charging thirty percent for the store, and they want a piece of that pie, and that's that's reasonable, that's understandable. All right, here's a good point. It's, someone it's, made in chat. Uh, Windows is a platform, a computer is a tool. So just as Steam is a platform, right? But by Microsoft not locking down their store, they allow other stores to exist, right? Without them getting a cut of it on their on their. Uh, or here's the thing. So why should Microsoft allow Steam to be installed on your computer without them getting a cut? They don't have to. Okay. All right. they, they can do it to make more money. Yeah. But it's not a free, like, they're not like, look, the whole issue is they want to make more money and that's why they're doing this. And I think to look at anything beyond that and try to like, as if like they were getting away with, you know, free riding is the issue. It's not a free riding issue. It's just, it's, they want to make more money. All right. And I understand why they want to make more money. You know, it's whatever. They got, they got shareholders. They got to get their bonuses, whatever. Cobra. But people are going to keep pirating anyway. <laughs> So I'm actually interested in what you guys think. Uh, I know the generic uh, internet opinion, but if you guys have any, you know, unique perspectives on it, you know, against or for uh, this kind of move. Uh, here's one more thing I'll say to defend it, which we haven't mentioned yet, and then I'll move. We can move on. How many of you were called by your grandparents to their house, you know, and you got to sit in their house and eat their food, and then spend two hours fixing their computer? Okay, because they downloaded spyware on their new Windows computer. If they had Microsoft Windows 10S and they had to go through the store, they would not have that spyware that they currently have, uh, and then you would have to go to their house to fix it every you know two weeks. That is a All that right. is a tremendous Here's, benefit, guys. I'll tell you I'll tell you the biggest problem, and this is why this this is what's going to happen. Microsoft is going to the better solution in my mind is for Microsoft to charge a subscription fee for Windows, and no, there's no optional subscription fee. It's a ten dollars a month or five dollars a month, right? If you want to use Windows, you're paying five dollars a month. It's required, right? And there might be initial blowback, but I think it'll be less blowback than the stupid app store, the, the Windows store. Look at Adobe, right? Adobe used to be a, a company that sold their, their overpriced software, like $1,000 for Photoshop, one shot on Amazon, right? 1000 bucks, And then they moved to a subscription model. Now you can buy, you get the whole Adobe suit for 50 bucks a month. And literally millions of people are paying $50 a month for the Adobe Creative Cloud. Millions. And the company's making more money than ever. Their stock price is all-time high because they're pushing the $50 a month subscription. And that's versus like a thousand dollar one time purchase for Photoshop. Microsoft, instead of selling, they're giving away. They give you basically your argument is they're giving away too much for too little. Yeah, it's a it's a very useful platform, and they can make so much money off businesses that still use Windows. Even if we all pirate, right? All the gamers, let's say all the gamers and all the tech savvy people pirate Windows, right? All the businesses will pay five dollars, ten dollars a month, and that'll be more money than the hundred dollars or 
In fact, Windows gets sold to Dell for like thirty dollars on the OEM price, like a wholesale price. So this this is solvable without adding additional friction to users and pissing off their user base. All right, this is very easily solved, and Microsoft will make more money than Steam on the okay. Like, so much more money oh, than Steam if they have a subscription. Let's say, let's say, I give it to you the the money part. Okay, I don't care about the money okay. part. Okay. Now, the second part I mentioned you didn't address. How hmm. what percent of people that currently use PCs would be better off? Okay, from their use experience, if they could only go through the store. So I'm talking about the grandmas. Yes, it, I'm talking it would, about the, it would help. It would help the grandmas. Yes. I'm talking about the grandmas. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking about 99 percent of the girls out. out there. You know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Because they're not playing games. Exactly. Like they're not. They're not. They're not editing. You know, crazy stuff. They're just. You know. On okay, Facebook. I'll give it to you. It, there's a benefit as well, obviously, because there are spyware issues, and <clears throat> we've all been there. You know, like my brother said, spending the time with your grandma's house or grandpa's house to fix their computer because they downloaded too much spyware. They thought weather bug or that you know, weather toolbar was a great idea. You know, and you open their PC and there's like 50 toolbars. This has happened to people. <laughs> you know, men my age, okay, have spyware issues. You know, so 20 something <laughs> men my age have issues with Microsoft <laughs> Windows. So this is, the, this is a very big problem. Uh, and I think this, I think I'm going to say 80% of people would be better off under this kind of Maybe. system. Maybe. I wouldn't. I'll be pissed off. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's stick, let's, I like the current system. All right. And speaking of, you know, we got let, let's touch about at least one more thing here because oh, there is God. a little bit of a controversy <laughs> with um <clears throat> more and more PG related controversy. Right, good, with good. Terra. Back, to, back to MMOs. All right, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So what happened was uh, Terra kind of abruptly said no more third party plugins whatsoever. Any third party program will be bannable offense. And it, some people are pissed off because people are using damage charts and other tools to kind of make their game experience better. And now they're told that any kind of uh, any kind of third-party plugins is a result in insta ban, and I don't know how I feel about this. I mean, I understand it's their right, but I feel like using damage charts to kind of track DPS and stuff it really improves your own quality of quality of life in the game. And I it, and there is a pretty clear blowback against this. There's a 31 page thread of people bitching. In fact, they 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 were closing threads of you know banning people on the forums that even talked about the policy now, right? Really? So now they made a new policy. Yeah. Then they backtracked on that very quickly that they realized <laughs> you can't. You know, stifle discussion. When you start when you start closing threads and banning people on your forums for discussing things you don't like, it gets so much blowback. So they they opened one thread and they said, Okay, all the discussion on this shit is over here. So now everyone's talking about it, everyone's kinda of pissed off. I'm gonna say feel about this. I'm siding with Terra. What why? <laughs> I'm siding with Terra. I think especially if you're a smaller studio or, or a smaller game like Terra. Mm -hmm. And by smaller I mean like you're not WoW or Final Fantasy, right? I know Terra's still <clears> pretty decent. Uh, you, it's hard to control the ecosystem if you allow these third-party plugins. What is what does on the server side? What does a damage meter look like, and what does a hack look like? A cheat engine look like? They probably look the same. You know, like they're they're pulling data from this, you know, from the client or whatever, and you you can't tell what they're trying to accomplish with that, you know, with that you know interference. All right. Here's the thing. I think most people, especially people upset about this, and even me, right. If you if if in mass if Blue Hole can tell us listen, by banning all third party plugins, we will get like a ninety nine percent effective ratio of banning cheaters. If they can if they can tell me for sure that doing this policy will reduce the cheaters like immensely, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the reality of the situation: they're gonna they're gonna ban all the third party software, and all the cheaters are gonna get away with it anyway. Nothing's no one believes that this is gonna stop cheating. That's the issue. Really? Okay, it, it, it won't <laughs> stop cheating, but you don't think. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, here's the thing. Imagine you are the the guy in charge at, at Terra. You got hired. Your job is to ban the hackers. Okay. Okay. Now, and, and guess what? Since they're cheap and you know free to play, they only hired you to handle the whole you know population. Okay. Now, are you gonna mm -hmm. just sit there with a cam and watch guys to see if they're cheating? You know, you know, you know, you know, you gonna do? You're gonna you pull. Can't. It has to be automated solution. Yeah. You, you're gonna find no. You're gonna here's what you do. You're gonna pull the list of you know clients connected and see which ones mm -hmm. are 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 running third party apps, right? Trying to sniff you, things. No, you can't. You can't tell that though. Usually, you can because the, their clients are probably receiving information from the uh, server that other people aren't. No, but isn't it? Aren't most of these plugins like DPS meters? It's all client side anyway. All that data is usually stored client side anyway. I don't, and it kind of. I don't think it's client side. I could be wrong, but I I think it probably uses the same. The, 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 here's what I'm trying to say: the detection tools they have to yeah that that you know would flag somebody for cheating or hacking are probably also flagging DPS meters today. And that's why they're doing this. I don't know. I, I mean, if that's the case, that makes it easier, a bigger, easier sell. 
But I think a lot of people are worried that they're gonna they're gonna do this and it's not gonna stop the hackers. It feels like I think I feel like we're at a point where everyone's kind of just like comes to the realization that you can never stop hackers. Like it's like a sad realization, but it's the reality. Like no game can really stop hackers anyway. The people that are gonna cheat are gonna cheat anyway. And I have I, I know people that's people still bought and cheat in WoW all the time. If WoW can't figure this out, how is Terra with one hundredth one one hundredth of the resources is gonna figure this out? I think everyone assumes the cheats are going to be there, and this is not going to fix it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, not that's fix, the biggest issue. It's not going to fix it, but I think it's going to make it easier. Like I said, um, for them to basically anyone anyone pulling more information or or associating with information differently than everyone else is automatically banned right now with this new policy, mm -hmm. and that makes I think the moderation much easier. And stuff like macros and stuff, you can use like other tools to you know put input commands like botting and stuff, I think a lot of that can work even with anti-cheat stuff because you can input commands to Windows and they can be you know done in-game. I'm just I'm just worried. Uh, people trying to, chaos trying to explain to me as well, it hooks to the executable. Okay, you know, assuming that even, you know, it's detectable, right? The, the damage charts and stuff. The people that do the hacks, there's, there's always, you know, a cat and mouse game of making the, making the hacks, you know, slightly different so it's undetectable, right? We've seen every game. There's cheats for MapleStory, there's cheats for WoW, there's cheats for every other more RPG. It's just, I just don't believe I think they're going to create more more harm than good at this point, you know. Personally, I, mean, personally, I, I don't know if, if it turns out to be a very positive experience. And by getting rid of the damage charts, getting rid of these other you know mods, that it's going to create a better example. Yeah, I'm okay with it. I think most people will, will as well. I think the best thing they could do is uh, release, in you know, internal built-in damage meters, mm -hmm. and and you know whatever UI customization, whatever else it is, people, uh, legit people are using third-party uh, programs for. Just kind of release internal mm -hmm. tools for that, uh, and then that way, you know, nobody has an excuse. I think one of the mods too, you know, there's a mod you can run that actually lowers your settings by like a lot to make the game playable on your on your toaster PC. That's also bannable. You change any of those files to run the game like at lower settings than the game lets you is also considered, you know, an issue. Again, that's probably has to do with hacking because I know uh, hackers and botters. What they do is they multi-client like twenty clients in yeah. one. Uh, computer, so that that could be one way they they get away with it on their computer, right? They all they run it all at like 800 resolution, and then you know the little boxes, mm -hmm. and they're just they're just bought. Well, again, I I just hope that actually results in a better anti cheat policy. I think you know you you you're the pro hack guy out of both of us, all right? But uh, yeah, I was surprised. Results... We, we took the wrong we took the yeah. wrong side on this issue. You know, I was. I know. <laughs> Like, like even like FF14, I think they, they have a tacit policy of not allowing any third-party plugins either. But there's a lot of third-party plugins out there for FF14 already. You know, you, you, it's, it's almost like a, it's a rule to not have it, but they don't really care, right? As long as you're not rubbing your damage meters in front of people and being like, "Haha, you suck at damage," right? They have it. They, they let you get away with it. But okay, here's it just, I, I don't think that the hacks will be detected in the same way. Let like, me give you I, a thought process here, okay? I, uh, hypothetical, okay. perhaps. But but I think this is probably how it works. Imagine you're the mm -hmm. mod or admin. You can see a list of let's say ten thousand clients currently running third-party apps. You don't know what they are, mm -hmm. but you can tell it's flagged that they're running something. Now, I would I would argue that ninety-nine point nine percent of hackers are in that group, rather than the people not running the third-party program that they got flagged. Even if most of them right, are are running damage charts, that group contains all the hackers. Hold on, hold on. Here's another idea that this this listen, Terra can't stop those gold spammers that literally spam. 50 plus hours straight. And you're going to tell me that they're going to be able to stop cheaters by banning damage meters. By, by stopping DPS meters, they're going to stop cheaters, but they can't stop gold spammers? Well, because they can auto flag. What is so obvious? No, no. The, the people who run third party apps, they get flagged, they're auto banned. There's no player, there's no user interaction required or admin interaction required. I haven't played Terra in a bit, so I don't know if the game actually has gold spammers, but I'm just saying a lot of games still suffer from gold spammers. Yeah, that requires, <laughs> um, what's it called? Active, you know, moderation. Mm hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I hope this results in less cheaters, but I I, I, I remain skeptical. You'll never stop. It's only, and more pieces especially, it seems like you can never stop. Like there are certain programs like botting, like if you can develop a bot sophisticated enough, like I don't think it even has to interact, like hook onto an EXE. It, can't, it can just input commands directly to Windows and you can bot it that way. So I think certain hacks are almost, almost un, you know, undetectable. You write the software yourself too. And a lot of these cheaters, you know, get get it from private areas where they you know just share it with a whole bunch of hackers at once, like gold farm and whatnot. But I think something like damage charts, like 
they should have an optional damage charge in game then. If they're gonna if they're gonna yeah, take yeah, away yeah, some yeah. quality of life okay, features, okay. yeah, we all we yeah, all, we they all can mitigate this. Yeah. yeah, you can mitigate the damage from banning third party plugins if you add some of those features that were added via third party plugins to the game. And I think there'll be a lot less blowback then. True, true. Uh, okay, before we run out of time, I want to cover one more thing at least. Mm -hmm. uh, Quake Champions. There's going to be a public test mm -hmm. on the 12th uh, to the 21st. Another game I want to play. There's a lot of games that we, we got to try this week, or this month at least. Yeah. Are you excited about Quake Champions? Uh, if you want to try it, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Mildly. I Mildly? mean, uh, FPS games, it's hard for me to get excited. In any, it, it's, it's a hero shooter too. It's a little different, right? But uh, I don't know. For FPS games for me, it's been Overwatch. I play, I play a lot more Overwatch than CSGO. I mean, I have my CSGO phase as well. I don't know. I, I, I don't play too many FPS games anyway. Mm -hmm. So I've never been huge on FPS. So, I mean, I'm going to try it just because it's kind of, you know, the next big thing. And hopefully it'll be different enough. Yeah, I'm excited. I got to say, I'm, I'm kind of on a nostalgia binge. I've been playing StarCraft, uh, the free one, mm -hmm. Brood War. They made it free now. Uh, and, you know, I grew up playing Quake. And uh, I am excited to give it another shot. They, and I'm looking at the graphics right now, the, the trailer. They kind of kept an old style look. So that's nice. Mm-hmm. And I think this game, I think uh, Quake Champions, I haven't even played Quake Champions right, yet, right? But I think it's going to kill uh, Lawbreakers, right? Really? <laughs> it's going to kill Lawbreakers, even though, never, even though I never played it yet. Only because Lawbreakers was like solidly like okay, right? But a solidly okay game isn't going to get me to pay for it. If it was free to play, you know, maybe. But I don't know. I, I wasn't a huge fan of Lawbreakers, personally. Of course... <laughs> Purecast, you forgot to mention the best FPS, obviously War Mode. I still maintain War Mode is the best FPS game out there. If you never played it, check it out on Steam. I think it's still around. <laughs> yeah, said it's going to absolutely uh, destroy Lawbreakers. Lawbreakers are instant install for me. I mean, look, some people do like it, but I, I don't know. I don't see how a buy-to-play game like Lawbreakers, it, it's got some you know pretty well-known people behind it, but free-to-play, Quake Champions, first buy-to-play, Lawbreakers. We'll see. I mean, I'll give you a more definitive answer after I play uh, Quake Champions. It's it's Bethesda. I'm, I'm going to say that correctly from now on. I always say Beth, uh, like Bethesda or something stupid. But how about Sunday? We Bethesda. play. Uh, we play some Quake. All right, I'm down to play that because I I, I got to do a video for Entropia I think on on Saturday, and we can do a we can do a Quake stream. Nice. All right, so uh, we are coming towards the end of the stream here. Mm -hmm. uh, check us out on Friday for Kirita. And then Sunday for Quake. Did you say Kirita? Like Kirita from Sword Art Online? I don't know what that game is called. What is it called? It's called Critica. Critica. Okay, my bad, guys. My bad. All right, Critica, not, not Kirito. <laughs> Kirito Online, yeah. Yeah. All right, stick around for the post game. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it for this week, YouTube. All right, take care, YouTube. Oh, before before you cut it, before you cut it, if okay. you want to support Mmos.com, check out our Amazon affiliate link. It is below Twitch as well as in the uh, YouTube description. Uh, if you're going to buy something on Amazon, click on that link and then just buy the same product you would normally buy anyway. It supports us. We get a small commission, like 2%, and it would be nice. All right. Indeed. All right. Take it easy.